Hi, it's Dwyer. Today is April the 19th, 2018. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. DwyerVIP.com, a free site. Let's discuss Canelo. Let's discuss the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Let's discuss Golovkin. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me congratulate the Nevada State Athletic Commission on suspending Canelo for six months. Right? Let me point out that the use of performance enhancing drugs should be a strict liability offense. Right? In other words, whatever your intent, whatever your intent, right? You fail, you fail you get six months, right? This should be like a parking ticket where, you know, your meter runs out. You don't get to run over to the meter maid and say, hey, you know, I was confused. You know, my morning was tainted. Forget all that, right? You fail, you fail. Insurance companies, they're very integral in boxing, right? They help people deal with risk management. Insurance companies, the powers that be, they should know that rule up front. When they're writing a policy on a fight, they need to look at the fighter and they need to understand the stakes involved. Right, let them help police the sport. Let me also say too, that whatever PR campaign the fighter then wants to engage upon, right? If he wants to talk about tainted meat, if he wants to talk about a tainted supplement, if he wants to talk about his own hurt feelings, whatever. He can mount whatever campaign he, he feels he needs to to connect with his fans. But this is really an adult business. Titles are at stake. People's health are at stake. You can't have some guy in the ring on performance enhancing drugs, whether he intends to be or not. Right? So as far as I'm concerned, the six months is very appropriate. Let me also say too, I don't think Canelo makes it back image wise from this. You already have some very well known people in boxing openly giving you their opinion that this guy's been juicing for some time, right? Golovkin talks about needle marks. Now Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. is saying that he believes Canelo was juicing. You have well-known trainer Ronnie Shields. These are boxing A-listers, folks talking about how it's obvious, looking at the changes in Canelo's body that he was juicing. Now the point as gamblers is simply, you're never gonna find out the truth, short of a confession, right? Short of some Lance Armstrong moment. You're never gonna find out the truth, never, ever. But you need to contemplate the possibility that this guy may have been juicing in the past, you need to recognize when you even think about betting on Canelo that you might be dealing with a guy who used to have an advantage that he no longer has. And that advantage might be bigger than physical. It might be mental, right? The mental side of things is a big part of juicing. You enter the athletic event feeling that you have an edge on folks who you suspect aren't juicing. Now, what happens when you show up and you know you had that edge in earlier fights, but you don't have the edge in this one? Because you failed a drug test, you got hit across the knuckles by the boxing commission, and now it's six months later, this is your first fight back and you're fighting naked. 
right? You're the guy, figuratively speaking, who was the former alcoholic, who was fueled by alcohol in giving public speeches, and who now has to do it sober. Right? Folks need to come to grips with the fact that there's a risk involved in betting on Canelo here going forward, right? Six months from now. That didn't exist before when he hadn't tested positive during a PED test. Right? Let me also say this too. In boxing, and I believe we're going to find this out at heavyweight shortly. It's very difficult to be a unified champion of three or more belts, right? The minute you are, you're dealing with three mandatories, right? Think about it. You fought your entire life. You get to the top. You're not only the champion, you're the champion times three different sanctioning bodies. Now, for a lot of us, that would be an opportunity to exhale. That'd be a chance to say, man, I've been working like a dog to get where I am, to have what I have. And now I'm going to see the wife a little bit more. Now I'm going to spend some time with my kids, make sure they know daddy's not always in camp training for a fight. Right? Well, I believe Golovkin is going to have a hard time keeping all of his belts. Right? They're going to be mandatories who say, hey, wait a moment, player, I'm not going to accept step-aside money. I want the fight. I've been working like a dog, too. Right? I've earned my mandatory contender status. I don't want to step aside and then hear that you're fighting Vanis Martirosian now. Okay. As long as I'm the next in line, then I'm hearing that some other mandatory is. Or some guy coming off a drug suspension. Canelo is. Right? The minute you have multiple mandatories, you got problems. Right? To paraphrase the notorious B.I.G. More mandatories, more problems. Right? So what you find is that some guys will collect belts. Terrence Crawford at 140. He'll become undisputed. And then he'll say bye to 140. Right? He can check that box off his bucket list. He's not even going to stick around the weight class to defend all those belts because he knows it's impossible. He's going to look for other challenges in the sport. Crawford now is fighting for the welterweight championship against Jeff Horn. Right? So, just like the date stamped on an old carton of milk, right? The expiration date, in my opinion, on the rematch between Golovkin and Canelo may have expired. Right? Golovkin's in his mid-30s. Folks, as much as all of us want to live forever, none of us do. Right? He's in his mid-30s. He has to be thinking about his final acts as a boxer. Right, This is the middleweight division. This isn't the heavyweight division where guys in their 40s like Vladimir Klitschko are still viable. This is middleweight. Right, Golovkin has to be thinking about his legacy. He's still an unbeaten fighter. He has to be thinking about the guys who gave him the hardest time in the ring, who are still viable, in my opinion, that's Danny Jacobs. He also has to be thinking about other weight classes that he might want to conquer. Right? Understand, we see these guys at the weigh-in. We don't know what it took them to get to the weigh-in. So Golovkin weighs 160 at the weigh-in. Folks, that's a lot of missed dessert. Right? Those extra helpings, forget it. Let's say he goes to the movies with his kids. The kids are having popcorn with butter. He's looking at his son jealous. Right? Understand, the 160 might be what he lost weight to get to. But his walking around weight might be much higher. Right? He might have an interest 
in the 168 pound division, right? One minute he's looking at Caleb Truax, middleweight. The next he's looking at Caleb Truax, super middleweight champion. And he has to be thinking to himself, man, I'm in this for legacy at this point. That super middleweight championship would look awfully good, awfully good on my resume. Right? How do we know that Golovkin in his mid-30s wants to stick around the division that he stuck around? Right? Think about it. Guys like Bernard Hopkins were middleweights, then they were light heavyweights. Right? Ray Leonard, welterweight, then he's up at super middleweight. Right? He beats the light heavyweight champion. Right? Andre Ward, he's at super middleweight. Then he's up at light heavyweight. Right? Understand, the history of boxing is filled with guys who get older. Those pounds are a little bit harder to get off in training camp. And then they start to think, hey man, I can take this guy one floor up. Not only that, it's going to look great on a resume, isn't it? Right? Think about everything Andre Ward has done. One of the biggest series of fights he had were the two fights against Sergei Kovalev. You remember them, don't you? Right? Bernard Hopkins, you remember his fights against Jean Pascal, don't you? Right? So, all I can say is this. I feel Golovkin can look back at that first fight against Canelo and say, hell, I think I won that fight. I think he won the fight. I'm sure many of you watching this video believe he won the fight. At a minimum, he held his own. In other words, he wasn't in there getting battered by Canelo. You didn't leave that fight thinking, man, Golovkin's a paper champ. No, you left that fight thinking, okay, well, you know, Golovkin held his own. So if I'm Golovkin, there are a bunch of guys who, to me, would mean more to my legacy at this point than a rematch with Canelo, right? Again, understand, this is a guy who's already in his mid-30s, folks. Not early 30s, mid-30s. So, I'm just talking for myself here. I'm just being completely selfish. I'm a fan of boxing. These are the guys who I'd rather see Golovkin fight. Right, if he's harboring the thought of not fighting Canelo when Canelo gets off suspension. Right, and keep in mind, Canelo is a guy who at one point said, Hey, I'm not, you know, I want to fight Golovkin, but I'm not going to fight him this year. Golovkin was kept waiting a long period of time to fight Canelo. Right? Let's, let's just think it through. Canelo even fought Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. before fighting Golovkin. Right? So, if I'm Golovkin and I'm reviewing my options, and if I want to lift my legacy, here are some of the guys I would consider fighting. Let me also say, too, boxing is a young man's sport. Right? If you just look at the sport every 18 months, every 18 months, you're going to have some new dangerous fighters emerge on the scene. Guys entering your division, commanding a lot of attention and having people wondering if it's still your era or if it's this young lion's era. So let's talk about the fights I think. I would prefer to see as a boxing fan than the rematch of Canelo against Golovkin. The first fight would be Golovkin against Danny Jacobs again. Folks, I think even the Golovkin people know they had some problems in that fight. Understand, that's the fight that snaps Golovkin's knockout streak. Right? Golovkin goes into that fight having blown out Cal Brook. And then, of course, Danny Jacobs. Excellent. 
right? Fight looks like it's going to be a blowout. Danny makes adjustments. The middle to later part of that fight is the most challenging for Golovkin. You're watching that fight and you can see that when Jacobs goes southpaw, behind a jab and movement, Golovkin's a little confused. Right, let me also point out the obvious too. Danny Jacobs has never failed a drug test. There's a certain authenticity to Danny Jacobs' performance that you don't have. Right, when we're talking about anyone who's failed a drug test at any time in their career. So, I'd love to see the Danny Jacobs rematch, right? More than the Canelo rematch. I'd love to see unbeaten, mandatory IBF contender, Sergei Darianchenko, ironically, Danny Jacobs' sparring partner, in against Golovkin, because this is a guy who has power, greater than 80% KO ratio, would try to force Golovkin on his back foot, and Kasim Uma had success doing so. And I think Darianchenko is a little bit more clever than David Lemieux, right? He's not going to sit there and get hit with a jab repeatedly. So I'd love to see that fight. I'd love to see Golovkin against former 154-pound champion. A guy who's unbeaten, Jamal Charlo. Right, folks, Charlo is tall. This is an action guy. I don't think Jamal Charlo knows how to have a boring fight. You turn on a Charlo fight and it's blood and guts. It's high action. This guy is high volume. Right? I'd be intrigued to see him try to slug it out with Golovkin, if you believe Golovkin has lost a step. Jamal Charlo is going to show that to you, front and center. Right, let's just say if Golovkin wants to be in a high action match against a guy with a punch, a guy with guts, a young guy who doesn't know what it's like to lose a fight, right, neither of them would. Charlo would be an excellent person. Let's talk styles. You heard me mention Caleb Truax, the former 168 pound champion. Folks, I have never seen a Caleb Truax fight where he wasn't trying to pin an opponent up on the ropes. Right now, Truax beat James DeGale the first time roughed up the gale, had the gale backing up, right? Truax mentally tough, right? That first the gale fights in the UK. Truax is an action fighter. As I said, because I th thought Kasim Uma looked great against Golovkin, right? Of all the opponents Golovkin's had, Uma with Danny Jacobs is among the top in terms of looking good against Golovkin. Here you have Truax, who's bigger than Kasim Uma, who's going to come in with the same mindset, who's going to try to get Golovkin on his back foot. Understand, when you're fighting Truax, you don't have to go looking for him. He's like the postman. He finds your address. He's knocking on your door. Right? Another fight, style-wise. Danny Jacobs looked great. Southpaw stance, right? Jacob switches to Southpaw. Is operating with movement behind a jab. I'd love to see Golovkin against former 154 pound unbeaten champion Demetrius Andre. Right? Understand Andre is so anxious for the fight, he's openly campaigning for it. Right? I don't believe Andre's about the payday. I think Andre believes that his style is the style to beat Golovkin. And, like Jacobs, he's tall. He knows how to use length. Right? He's much more athletic than guys like Murray. 
right? The British fighter who, who lost to Golovkin. And finally, let me say this, and I know this name's going to surprise some people, but speed kills. This guy still has hand speed, folks. Let's remember, too, that he's going to be hard to find in the ring. A lot of Golovkin's game is to stay away from you early. He's a cautious stalker. Stay away from you early, figure out the angles, then he's throwing bombs. He seems to have a lot of success against tall guys, Martin Murray, um, the guy he hit on the head, uh, Marco Antonio Rubio, guys like that, right? He has a lot of success when he can see you and he can hunt you. Now, a guy with great footwork from a southpaw stance who is sudden, who can get in and get off straight left hands and then back back out and move around the ring. A Manny Pacquiao could be devastating to Golovkin. Now I know some are going to say, hey, what about the size gap, right? Didn't Golovkin already fight Kell Brook, a guy coming up from Welter? Manny Pacquiao beat Antonio Margarito for the 154-pound championship. Now, I know it was fought at a catch weight. Okay, whatever. But let's just say, if you were impressed by the golovkin Cal Brook fight, and understand, that fight's one of the major fights on both of those guys' resumes. Just imagine Golovkin against Manny Pacquiao. Kel Brook is not a southpaw, folks. Manny Pacquiao is. Kel Brook is easier to find in the ring than prime Pacquiao. If Pacquiao can come in and fight low, right? Think Rocky Marciano in some of his fights. Pacquiao comes in, he's fighting low. If Pacquiao can move around the ring, make it hard for a two-handed slugger from distance like Lovkin to time him, to hit his head. I think a Manny Pacquiao-Golovkin fight would be spectacular. Let's be clear here too. Both Golovkin and Manny Pacquiao are future Hall of Famers. They're at the part of their careers, well into their 30s, where they're taking fights for legacy purposes. They want lines on the resume. Right? They want people to look back and say, oh, that's Hearns Hagler. You know, that's, you know, Leonard Hearns. That's Leonard Hagler. Right? They want the big fights people are going to remember. Right? This fight is right in front of them. So let me just say this. I hope Canelo makes it back. I think his image has taken a big hit because I'm not sure if you come back from the public knowing that you failed not one but two drug tests, right? Let me also say, too, the quality of the excuse, tainted meat, was weak at best. When you're a multimillionaire training for a multi-million dollar payday in a rematch, I think it's hard for the public to believe that you can't ship meat in. That you can't, you know, you can't go out and buy gourmet meat, right? It's just hard for me to believe that Canelo's getting meat off the food truck. Also, the fact that there was prior precedent, in other words, other guys ate tainted meat and failed tests, right? To me, hurts Canelo because he should have known better than to put himself in the same situation. The tainted meat story sounds like a cover story, right? Doesn't sound like the real thing. And of course, there's the tape. We're in a YouTube era, right? When you look at fighters and suddenly the fighter in his 20s has lost body fat and looks a hell of a lot more muscular and has a hell of a lot more hand speed. Maybe the guy's just working harder. Maybe the guy was partying and hanging out in his early 20s and didn't get serious until his mid-20s. 
right? But there are other ways to explain it. Other speculation, it's not going to be favorable to the fire. Right? So as I've said, the Canelo situation is noteworthy by the people who have come out and who are openly questioning not just his present, but his past. Right? Golovkin's not talking about seeing needle marks yesterday. He's talking about seeing needle marks a while back. Right? Ronnie Shields, when he's talking about, look at the changes to his body. He's not talking about changes between yesterday and today. He's going back. Right? I believe in second chances, but let's just say, if I am Golovkin at this point, I really have to wonder about how much glamour, how much allure the rematch with Canelo will bring. Would it bring him more allure than a rematch with Danny Jacobs? What about a fight against Manny Pacquiao? where Pacquiao shrewdly buys a ticket for Cal Brook, so Brook sits in the front row, right? Maybe they'll even be clever and have that fight in the UK. If that fight came off, and I know some people are going to say, Manny was roughed up by Jeff Horn. Why wouldn't he be roughed up by Golovkin? The Jeff Horn fight's close. Could have gone either way. Jeff Horn leans on you. He puts his body on you. When you watch Jeff Horn, you'll often notice Jeff Horn has like his hand on you as he's inside. That's not Golovkin's game. Golovkin blasts you out of there. But Golovkin doesn't want you holding him and Golovkin's certainly not going to come up and hold you. Right? So, let's just say Golovkin has options. What I expect to happen is that some of the decisions are going to be made for him. He's a dominant champion. But I believe some of these sanctioning bodies are going to say, look, if you're not going to fight Darianchenko soon, we're going to strip you. And the problem is, if Golovkin's on the verge of a rematch with Canelo or Danny Jacobs, he's not going to get to Darianchenko. Right? If he starts fighting every mandatory, right? He's going to be missing out on some big payday fights. Food for thought. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Let me also point out too, I've been commenting here online on Canelo's career since he was a teenager. Just Google Dwyer Saul Alvarez, right? You'll see some old videos. I know whenever I'm critical of a fighter, whether it's Manny Pacquiao, whether it's Anthony Joshua, whether it's Saul Alvarez, there's going to be a sizable group out there that's going to say, Dwyer, you're just a hater. Why are you hating on Miguel Cotto? Right? I'm just calling it as I see it. Canelo made a mistake. Right? He's paying for it. The question is, how many other people have to pay for Canelo's mistake? How long do you want Darianchenko waiting for his shot at Golovkin's title? How long do you want Golovkin, a great champion in his mid-30s, to wait to fight Canelo again in a rematch? Right? How many more fights does Manny Pacquiao have? Let's just think it through. Jamal Charlo, Demetrius Andre, these guys are unbeaten. Why should they sit around and wait for the clouds to clear on somebody else's suspension before they get a shot on the dominant middleweight? Let me also say, too, Billy Joe Saunders, folks, think it through. That's the fight style. That's the fight style. That would give Golovkin problems. Folks, that would be a unification match at middleweight. Given all of these options and all of these opponents, and understand Saunders has said, look, man, I'm not going to be an old man in boxing. 
I'm on the clock. I'm putting myself on the clock. I'm only in this game for so much more. Right? With all of these options, do you, the fight fan, and leave the answer in the comment section. Want Golovkin waiting around for a rematch with Saul Alvarez? Would that fight mean more to you than unbeaten Golovkin against unbeaten Saunders? for the Unified Middleweight Championship. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.